people that have gathered here and those that are gathering around the country that are watching uh, via Facebook. We appreciate all of you. We love you and are so happy that you've uh, taken the time to, to spend with us this morning and to worship the Lord and amen, to show our our appreciation for all that God is doing in our lives. Amen. And we thank you again for that. You're all well and safe. And we have some uh, people, old friends, obviously, and, and church members that have uh, come back to church this morning. And we certainly understand the hesitancy of others and uh, trying to work through all of this and figure out the best uh, approach uh, in the future. But just let us let, let us let you know that we are here and we're going to be holding services for any and all that want to come and be a part of it. For those of you who either can't because of uh, geography or health uh, issues, we love you and we're still with you. We're all still together in spirit. Amen. And uh, God wants to do a great thing in all of our lives. And we're appreciating all of you for being a part. Thank you so much for your support uh, over the past several months, actually over years. But uh, under the circumstances of the last few months, it was really special to see how people have stepped up and continued to support the church. And that just amazes me and blesses me so much. And uh, we're grateful to all of you uh, for being family. Praise the Lord. And uh, so God bless you all. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Thank you. I want to thank Tim. Great to see Tim back up here again. Amen. I was uh, just so glad to see somebody besides me up here. Praise the Lord. And uh, But Tim, I really appreciate you. You know that. And uh, he's done a great job over the years for us. And uh, always brings a good word of the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord just uh, is there in the, in the presence of uh, His speaking to us. Praise the Lord. We appreciate that. And uh, again, uh, Mike and Suzanne doing so much uh, to keep everything together, taking care of all the Internet stuff and, uh, and so many other things as well. But uh, I just love and appreciate them so much for the, for the effort that they're putting into all of this to try to make this available to anybody and everybody that uh, that wants to have access to it. So God bless them and God bless you all for being here. Praise the Lord. It is so good to see smiling faces out here. Praise the Lord. I got to tell you. Amen. It's been weird, hasn't it? I mean, uh, at, that's the best, the best I can say for it. But uh, what the heck? We've been through crap before, haven't we? I mean, we all have. If you've lived any length of time, we've been through stuff. We're going to get through this, too. It's just a weird thing. And, uh, but God's with us. Amen. And he's going to get us through. Praise the Lord. Amen. amen. So thank the Lord for all of it and all of you. Praise God. Sally and I have been doing a lot of yard work, which I'm sure everybody has yeah. been. Nothing else to do. Praise the Lord. But, but I like being out in the yard anyway, and for whether we have to or not. So we've had chances to, to spend quite a bit of time doing clean up and the regular mowing and trimming and tree limbs and all that stuff. And I, I discovered something the other day. You know how you can tell if it's a dogwood tree? See, Sally's all into horticulture and all that stuff. But by its bark. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. It's not much different with people here, you know, I'm noticing. So, You know which bear is the most condescending? A panda. Duh. Duh. Okay, I'll dig a little deeper next week. Praise the Lord. You know why uh, melons have uh, weddings? Because they can't elope. That was my fruit joke. Praise the Lord. But listen to this, women. If your guy can't appreciate your fruit jokes, you need to let that man go. Mango. God bless you. We're almost done. You know what's red and smells like blue paint? Red paint. Oh, just one groan. Thank you, Tim. Praise the Lord. All right. God bless you all. Appreciate it. Little humors are good, even if it's bad humor. Anything just to kind of make you think somebody's dumber than me. Praise God. So I want to talk to you this morning about some things that God has been speaking to me. And, and uh, as always, Tim just nailed it. I mean, he's quoted multiple scriptures that, uh, that the Lord had spoken to me and, and talked about many of the same things that I want to share with you this morning. So appreciate the Holy Spirit and his leading. Amen. And the unity that we find as a result of that. So it's always good. Praise the Lord. So I want to start out this morning. I want to read uh, Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3. These are obviously scriptures that we've read many, many times, but uh, 
I just want to set some things up here. So beginning with Hebrews 11, talking about faith here. Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 3. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Praise the Lord. So let's go to um, Mark chapter 4, and we'll read verses 35 through 41. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. Praise the Lord. Amen. Again, appreciate everybody joining us on Facebook, and uh, hope the signal's coming through fine. Everybody's getting it. I know Sally isn't because she has problems with a computer. Praise the Lord. She gets it, but she always gets it 20 minutes after everybody else. So I could say anything I wanted to about her, and she wouldn't know it, but she will. So I can't say anything. Yeah. So the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they woke him, and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he rose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, we know that Jesus is the word of God. Whatever he says is going to come to pass. Amen. They didn't understand that maybe, but that's, I think the word that God is trying to get across to all of us in these days is that what his word says is what's going to, how it's going to end. It's how it's going to work. Amen. On every level. So this, this story though, it's a dramatic and uh, actually it, it seems like a, a, a life and death story the way it's told. And uh, it involves Jesus, it involves the disciples, a boat, uh, amen, and uh, what they thought would be a smooth sail across the lake, amen, or the Sea of Galilee. So I'm fascinated by the story of Jesus and the disciples in this boat ride because the disciples feared for their lives. They were scared to death, amen. And they even wondered and openly questioned how Jesus could be sleeping during all of this. Doesn't he care? I mean, what is he oblivious to the problems we're going through? Doesn't he realize what a horrible thing we're faced with? And, and he doesn't seem to be responding to it at all. Amen? But we've got to remember that Jesus never promised him a smooth sail. He didn't say, hey, it's going to be a, like a fairy tale trip across this lake. He just said, we're going to the other side. Amen? Right? And so we're getting to the other side of the lake with the mess, with the doubts, with the pain, with the tension, with the anxiety, with the fear. We're going to get to the other side. Praise the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. I'm telling you, we're living in a time where these... These scriptures are, are becoming our reality, whether you like it or not. So this is what God has said. This is what we should be doing. We walk by faith, not by sight. Amen? And now if we're made for relationship with God, why is it we can feel so distant and separated from Him? Have we missed some key concept or have we failed to grasp the right formula? The truth is, faith is and always has been a weird, awkward reality. It's not humanly natural. It's not natural for physical beings to operate by faith. But we are spirit beings. We just happen to have a body. And that's the difference between us and the unsaved. Amen. Joshua chapter 5, uh, verses 13 through 15. So Jesus, the word of God, spoke, we're going to the other side. The disciples should have known, we're going to the other side. If he said it, if that's the word of God, then it has to come to pass, right? So here Joshua is, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us 
or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot. The place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. The well, first thing we have to recognize is this wasn't an angel. This was a manifestation of God. Had, had it been an angel and Joshua fell down to worship him, the angel would have said, Don't worship me. They ne you never see an angel accepting worship, amen, from a human. Praise the Lord. So it was a revelation of God. It was a manifestation of God. It was Jesus pre-birth is what I'm saying. Praise the Lord. And so after 40 years in the wilderness, Joshua and Israel are ready to go into the promised land. Amen. Into the land that flows with milk and honey is what they were told. Amen. And so they, they, they were to do this starting with the city of Jericho. And see, but Joshua was about to undergo a dramatic course correction. He really thought it was about their strength of their armies and going in to, t to take these cities, amen, for the Lord. And, uh, but this manifestation with the unsheathed sword appears to Joshua just outside of Jericho. What does the scripture say? The sword is the word of God. Amen. This was a manifestation of God in the pre-birth of Jesus himself. Amen. Of God in the flesh, in other words. Amen. The sword is the word of the God. Uh, is the word of God. Excuse me. So it's, a, it's an, uh, an extra emphasis on the fact that this is God's word incarnate. Amen. And he's holding that sword as a, uh, as a reminder of that reality. Amen. And apparently that wasn't enough uh, to intimidate Joshua when the being showed up in front of him. So he challenges him with this. Whose side are you on? Right? Ours or the enemies? And he says, neither. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Because remember, there are giants in the land. There are demonic influences in that land. In fact, they were totally dominated by the demonic. And that's why God wanted Israel in there to move them out, to take possession of that promised land. Amen. And so Joshua was literally brought to his knees by God's reminder that it wasn't his battle. It wasn't Israel's battle. Amen. See, it's easy sometimes for us to forget we're part of a bigger narrative. We think about the problems that we're dealing with personally, and that's only natural. But there's a bigger scene taking place here besides the pandemic or whatever they want to call it in my neighborhood or in my city or in my state. There's something going on here that's even bigger than the pandemic. Amen. It just happens to be a manifestation of the evil. Amen. That's in the world. Praise the Lord. The devil knows his time is short. He's got to whip some stuff up. And if he can't kill us outright, he'll try to scare us to death. He'll try to get people so intimidated that they won't interact with each other. They won't love one another. They won't be a manifestation of God himself. Amen. We can all fall prey to stress. Amen. To pain or to pressure. And we can let situations and circumstances or obstacles become bigger in our sight. Amen. Than the God who is trying to lead us. And that's what the, that's the problem I've got with media. There's never any talk about God unless it's, the result of something God's doing. In other words, this is God's punishment or God's judging or something. And the truth is they don't know what they're talking about, whether it's God or the pandemic or anything else. They're just talking to hear themselves talk. I've heard them just say the dumbest things. And, and every five seconds they're trying to encourage us with more fear. Which makes, it makes no sense to me whatsoever. You know, I get it. I, I'm, I'm proud of the people that are out there, the nurses and doctors and, and uh, police and, and so forth that are working in this environment. But come on, every five minutes, it's about how much we love these people, and we do, and then it's right back to some other negative about how many died today and how many they're expecting tomorrow. I mean, I get it. If it's somebody that's close to you, if it's your family, it's important. But come on. We don't, have to, we don't have to talk about this 24 hours a day. Every five minutes there's an update. And why? It's to keep the fear always in front of us instead of the promises of God. I'm not saying it's intentional on their part, but you're either influenced by God or you're influenced by the enemy. There isn't any in-between stuff here. Praise the Lord. So it's, I, I get it. We can, we can become uh, concerned and, and anxious and, and let the situations or the circumstances or the problem, whatever it is, become bigger in our sight than God who is trying to lead us. Amen. The battle is the Lord's. 
Amen. I don't care how many, uh, you know, viruses or, or, or vaccines or anything else they come up with. God is the source of our escape or our deliverance. Amen. Period. Amen. Now, I'm all for anything else, but if anything, any uh, vaccines or anything that come out of it, it's going to be because of the wisdom of God dealing with other people through people. Amen. To bring it to pass. I'll take it however God wants to do it. I don't care if it's a vaccine or if he just blows this thing out of here. It doesn't matter. Praise the Lord. Walking by faith instead of sight, it requires awareness that our eyes can play tricks on us. And you, if you don't know that, sit in front of that TV for a couple of hours. You'll be depressed. If you weren't depressed when you first sat down there, you will be by the time you get out of there. You're, it's like you just want to go take a shower and then go out and run around the block after you get dressed just to get it out of your head, right? I mean, just to not be having to focus on it or think about it. Praise the Lord. So our eyes can play tricks on us. They, it can convince us things that are true that are, that are not true. Amen? Reality can be deceiving. And the true path is often counterintuitive. I mean, it's... Kind of like what uh, Sheila was saying. You know, the, the, the simplicity of this, of her sharing with her grandchildren, uh, and then wondering, what should I do in this situation? It's, it's like counterintuitive. You're, you're, you're telling yourself, well, there's got to be something bigger. There's got to be something more. And then God just says, hey, what you've been doing is right. That's good. I mean, just keep doing what you've been doing. Amen. Just keep lifting me up. Just keep encouraging people with me, with what I can do for them, what I can be for them. Amen. I mean, think about... Let's think back to Jericho. From our perspective today, in hindsight, it all seems to come together and it makes sense. We're not really overly shocked by it. It just seems like, well, that's what God does. You know, I mean, that makes sense, right? But Israel won a victory over a walled city with no loss of life among them. Cities that had military, had had that for years, and Israel has had 40 years of fear and now they're trying to develop an army out of nothing, uh, or out of very little, praise the Lord. And Israel wins this victory and nobody dies on Israel's be on side. And God got the glory and his people learned again not to put their trust in human leaders or their plans, but instead to do the will or the word of God who delivers. Praise the Lord. That's where we're at today. I'm not against the government. I mean, we're trying to comply with their restrictions and their requirements because that's what we do. But I, my confidence is not in the government, not the Republicans, not the Democrats, not in the government, period. I appreciate those that are trying to do, but if you've noticed, the vast majority of them are hiding out in their multi-million dollar mansion someplace, and they're not doing their job. They're just expecting us to do ours, right? So, I mean, let's put our faith where our faith belongs, and that's with God. Amen? Amen. But what if we were there? What if we were back in that time when uh, Israel was faced with this situation? What, what would be, if we didn't have the benefit of, of hindsight, what would we be thinking? How would we be approaching it then? Would human logic tell us something different than what God said? I mean, when you enter into the enemy territory, soldiers should lead, not priests. Does that sound like the government to you? Praise the Lord. It's the strength of armies and weapons that win battles, amen, against defended walled cities. Not the noise of shouting and trumpets. From Israel's perspective at that time, every part of God's command or his word was counterintuitive. It made no sense at the time. We're going to go into this fortified city and we're going to walk around it seven times and then we're going to shout and blow a horn. Now, if that's not counterintuitive, I don't know what it is. I mean, that makes no sense in the natural, logically speaking. Amen? So why is walking by faith better than walking by sight? Because that's what they were asked to do. Walk. Seven times. The, the completeness of God. The fullness of God. Amen? Because sight alone won't convince us that trusting God and His Word will lead to life. And that more abundantly. We think there's got to be a plan. There's got to be a scheme. There's got to be a way of doing this that we can come up with to settle it, take care of it. But see, life, I've lived a few years, and I've discovered that it is relentlessly difficult. Praise the Lord. And I'm not being negative. I'm just saying there's always been difficulties. There's always been issues. There's always been another issue or another thing to face or to deal with. Amen. So it's, it's ongoing. 
So an essential part of life is learning to live with the questions that faith brings into being. That's what we're dealing with right now. My challenge for me personally is to live the questions that faith brings up. Amen? I mean, here it is all around us. I'm still going out and doing my stuff. I'm still going where I got to go and getting what I got to get and doing what I got to do. I'm wearing a mask when I go to Menards because they won't let me in unless I do. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I have more faith than anybody else. I'm just saying I'm just going to trust the Lord because I can't keep this crap away. I mean, you, you, you don't know who is and who isn't and what has it and where did it come from. And neither does anybody else, to be quite honest with you. They're just th throwing stuff out there thinking that we'll believe them because they got a Ph.D. or something. Praise the Lord. Questions bring faith into being. It's not a negative. It's a positive thing. Amen? Look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. So the secret of living life, amen, isn't in us navigating our way to safety. But instead, it's simply trusting God's leading, or God's word. Not in my ability to get me to point B or C or wherever it is I'm trying to get to. Any more than it was the disciples' job to figure out how to get to the other side of the lake. They just need to stay in the boat with Jesus. Amen? But instead, simply trusting God. Trusting that He is good. Trusting that even if we don't like it or understand it, He's taking us to a destination for a reason. He didn't bring the stuff, but He's going to get us through it. And He's going to get us through it because He has a purpose in it. He will make a positive out of a negative every single time. Amen? Let's look at this in Numbers chapter 13, verses, uh, verse 33. Just Numbers 13, verse 33, and then we'll go to chapter 14. Numbers 13, 33, and he said, There we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Man, if that doesn't speak to me about the situations that we're facing today, you know, human beings in general, right? So let's go to chapter 14 now in verses 1 through 3. So we see this pandemic, it's a giant, you know, and we're like nothing in, in comparison, and it's just going to overwhelm us, and how are we going to deal with it, and what are we going to do? And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, would to God that he, we would have died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? Now what's amazing about this message is, it's the majority that's saying it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Whether it was the 10 out of the 12 spies, or the entire population of Israel at the time, the vast majority of them, this is exactly what they were saying. Why did you even bring us out? Why did you save us just to kill us? Can I get a witness? Praise the Lord. Why did I get born again? Just so you could kill me? Amen. What concerns me is that today in the world that we live in, the tendency of the majority is to look at how big the threat is. How frightening the thing might be. How uh, misunderstood it is. Amen. It's how weak we are. How hopeless is our ability to see God's kingdom established in this world. Praise the Lord. Like, how's it going to happen? We're all going to be dead. We're, we're, what's going to happen? Why hasn't God shown up? Why hasn't God done this? Why hasn't God done this? How about greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world? This is the truth. This is what God says. Amen. We are well able to take the land. We are well able to deal with this situation and this circumstance. Amen. If God is for us, who or what can be against us? Amen. The promised land. In the Old Testament, the promised land was a geographic location. And we know that that's what Joshua is dealing with right now. But we also know that all of this was given as 
inspiration or, or, or reason for us to understand the spiritual truth that is trying to be revealed here. Amen? So in the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the promised land, the land that flowed with milk and honey, was a geographic space on the planet. Amen? In the New Testament, or under the New Covenant, the promised land, or the land that flows with milk and honey, amen, is resting in the finished work of Jesus. Amen? It's what Jesus has already done, amen, that get, takes us to the land or to the place of milk and honey. Amen? Look at Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 3. And this is where it's, it, it, he speaks back to this because he's talking about the children of Israel not entering into the promised land because of the majority of them all saying, oh, no, there's bad stuff over there and they're going to get us and we can't fight against it. We're not big enough. We're not strong enough. And they had no trust or confidence in God, even after all that God had already done for them. So he says, let us therefore fear. Now he's speaking of us under the new covenant. He said, therefore, let us fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest, and how, this is how we know it's the rest, is the finished work of Jesus, because he says, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Praise the Lord. Now, he's talking to us here. He's not talking about people living under the Old Covenant. He's talking to the believers of today. Amen? A land flowing with milk and honey. Praise the Lord. You know, honey flows from the promised land. Amen? And that's the rest in the finished work of our Lord. Amen? That's honey. That's sweetness. Amen? Now, look at the, I'll show you what I'm talking about here. David said in, let's look at Psalms 81, verse 16. David said, um, honey from the rock. Let me, let me get honey from the rock. This is David. We should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat, and with honey out of the rock should I have satisfied thee. Amen? Jesus is the rock that David is talking about here. Amen? So then in Samuel chapter 14, verse 25 through 30, it's this eye-opening or eye-enlightening substance that Jonathan finds dripping from the trees of the woods during the slaughter of the Philistines. Amen. They were supposed to get whipped up on good by the Philistines. But he said he should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat. Okay, what, uh, did I give you the scripture? I'm sorry. Which was the first Samuel? Uh, it's 1 Samuel 14, 25 through 30, yeah. So here's the honey out of the rock. Jesus is the rock. Praise the Lord. We're talking about us receiving the flow of milk and honey. Praise the Lord. The milk of the word. And they all, and all they of the land came to a wood, and there was honey upon the ground. And when the people were come into the wood, behold, the honey dropped. But no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. Jonathan, but Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. The oath was, don't eat, well, nobody's eating anything until we get this. In other words, we're going to make God do something for us by sacrificing here. But Jonathan hadn't heard it. He didn't hear when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore, he put forth the end of his rod that was in his hand and dipped it in the honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were opened or his eyes were enlightened. They then answered one of the people and uh, said, the, your father straightly charged the people with an oath saying, curse be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, my father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you how my eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more, if happily, the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. In other words, what he's saying is if we had all taken Christ, if we had all received Jesus, how much more would the defeat of our enemy have been? How much greater would have been the victory for us? My father troubled the land because he was trying to get us to do something that would change God's opinion or God's mind about the situation. And what Jonathan said was, if we'd all just taken the honey, our eyes would have been open to the goodness of God, to the grace of God, to Jesus, in other words, and we, our victory would have been even greater. Praise the Lord. All right. So it's honey and milk. Amen. 
How about this? Uh, Solomon uh, 4, verse 11. Song of Solomon, verses 4 and 11. It's honey and milk. Under, uh, the scripture says, under the tongue of the bride. Amen? Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as thy honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue. And the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. He's talking to the church. We have Jesus right here in our mouth. And that's what we have to be saying. That's what we have to be doing. That's what we have to be sharing. This is our promised land. This is the milk and honey that flows from God. And it's right here. It's available to us. And we're looking for other stuff. We're looking for vaccines. We're looking for... And I'm not against any of that. I'm just saying our focus needs to be on Jesus and what God has promised us, what God has declared to be the truth in our lives. Amen. And the rest of the stuff will have to take care of itself. This, is, this battle is not ours. It's the Lord's as long as we leave it in His hands and trust Him to do what only God can do. I mean, I'm grateful for scientists and I'm grateful for doctors and all that kind of stuff. But my, my confidence is in the Lord and not in the medical establishment. Amen. If they get a cure, it'll be because of God. Amen. So thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue. Amen. Praise the Lord. So thank the Lord. Amen. And how about it? This is also honey. And it's, it's the answer to the third day riddle of Samson who found honey in the carcass of a lion. Amen. Look, look at this in Judges chapter 14, verses 5 through 9. Judges 14. 5 through 9. See, it's all through the scripture over and over that this is available to us. This Jesus, the honey, amen, the finished work is ours. We just have to receive it. We have to accept it. Amen. So then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath. Now this is, Samson's uh, trying to <laughs> hit on, he's hitting on this heathen woman. He's wanting her to marry him. And uh, his folks are totally against it. They don't want him having anything to do with it. And the heathens really don't want Samson either. They're just afraid of him. So he, Samson goes down with his father and his mother to Timnath. And he came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. Now he's been going back and forth to this gal's home. And so this lion roared against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. In other words, he just broke its neck or killed it. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So he didn't tell him about the lion, didn't tell him that he killed him. And he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. In other words, she, he, he liked her. And after a time, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother, and he gave them, and they did eat. But he didn't tell him that he had taken it, the honey, out of the carcass of the lion because that would have been unclean. Right? Because it was a dead animal. So he took thereof in his hands. All right, now look at this, uh, verses 13 and 14. Just for the sake of time, we'll skip that. So uh, verses 13 and 14, he says, if you cannot declare it me. Now he's dealing with this gal. He's wanting this woman. And they're saying, no, no, no. And he's saying, I'll tell you what. If I, if I give you a riddle and you can't solve it, you're going to have to give me all kinds of clothing and jewelry and you know, swag or whatever you want to call it. He was going to get a, a big blessing out of this. And so he says, if you can declare it to me, then shall you give me 30 sheets, 30 changes of garments. And they said unto him, put forth thy riddle that we may hear it. And he said unto them, out of the eater came forth meat and out of the strong came forth sweetness. And they could not in three days expound the riddle. Praise the Lord. So here's the, the message is simply this. The lion is king. Amen. The king is Jesus. And three days and three nights of the person and work of Jesus declare to us, amen, that out of the death, burial, and resurrection of the king comes sweetness. Praise the Lord. Amen. Or you could say the promised land. The rest. Wherewith the weary find rest. Amen. So our victorious king has risen. Praise God. This kingdom is here. It's not coming. It's not something we're waiting for. It's here. Because Jesus is here. Amen. And he is. Seek first the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? Jesus. The kingdom's come. The kingdom is here. It's a question of whether or not we will acknowledge it and live from that kingdom. Or from our own efforts. Amen. 
A victorious church. It's what the Bible's telling me is there is a victorious church on the scene right now. It's just a question of them waking up to who they are and what they are with God on their side. Amen? Amen? And the gates of hell, as Scripture says, once we come into that understanding, the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. Once we realize that Jesus is here, the kingdom has come, amen, then the gates of hell can't prevail. They have to be defeated. Praise the Lord. Amen? And so if you've been... Uh, if you believe it, if you believe what I'm saying here this morning, amen, then you have repented according to the Bible. Amen. You have changed your mind about who's in charge, about who has control, about who is, amen, ultimately the victor. Praise the Lord. So we're moving from defeat to victory. Praise the Lord. The giants are bred for us. This coronavirus is bread for us if we will operate the way God has intended us to. We can defang this thing in no time. Amen. We can, we can make it something that will cause the church to rise up and take its true influence in the world today. Amen. Or we can cower in the corner. Amen. And I'm not, listen, I'm not judging people that have pre-existing conditions or any of that stuff. So don't get me, don't misunderstand me here. You, everybody has to operate at their own comfort level. Amen. But I'm just saying, the sooner we understand that God is our source and our healing and our deliverance, amen, and not the medical profession or the United States government. With all the good that they do, they're not the answer. I've got to tell you, if they were the answer, this would have never happened in the first place. Amen? Amen? So, look at, again, let's go back to Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. And the analogy here in these things is just amazing to me. But this is exactly what Jesus is up against. The same thing Joshua was up against. In fact, Joshua is Jesus. It's, a, it's the same name, amen, in the Hebrew, Yeshua. So the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Now that's... A mess because everybody can see it they're scared to death they don't understand it how are we going to do this where did it come from and he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep wasn't bothering him at all he knew he had already said we're going to the other side so he wasn't concerned about what they were seeing or thinking or fearing because he knew ultimately their destination would be arrived at because if, if he hadn't said it then there'd be something to worry about because he said it it had to come to pass amen and so he was in the hinder part and they woke him up and said master carest thou not that we perish and he arose and rebuked the wind. Now, I know I'm hearing people pray right now. I've heard them on TV. Now, I'm talking about religious people more than anything else. But, oh, God, help us. Oh, God, you know, please do something. Look, God's already done. He's already done what needs to be done. It's just a question of whether we're going to believe it or not. Amen. And Jesus had already told them we're going to the other side. But they quickly forgot what he said. And they were totally engulfed by what they were seeing and what they were hearing around them. The waves and the wind and the storm and so on and so forth. And so he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Praise the Lord. I'll just skip the last verse. It's not that relevant. But let's look at Mark chapter 5. Skip to the next chapter, Mark 5. And I want to read verses 1 through 13 to show you what's going on here with this coronavirus. And I believe this to be the truth. Yeah, there was a storm. Yeah, there was all kinds of crap hitting them. Why? Because there was a destination that they were bound for that was going to destroy the enemy. And the devil knew it, and he was doing everything he could. This wasn't just some random storm. This was demonically inspired. Amen. It was coming from the enemy, just as this pandemic thing is coming from the enemy. It, it didn't come. It came because of the influence of Satan. And that's what he's trying to do is to destroy us. Amen. And so they came over to the other side of the sea in the country of the Gadarenes. And when there was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him. No, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Now I'm thinking uh, religious uh, connotations here. So this demonic spirit had been, there had been religious, uh, what do I say, uh, resistance to it. But it was religious resistance and not Jesus. It wasn't the word of God. It was just their hope 
And so they tried to bind him. But then it didn't work. You couldn't keep the enemy down. You couldn't stop the enemy with fearful tactics, with tactics of trying to protect yourself rather than trying to destroy the enemy. And this is, so Jesus says, always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. But when Jesus saw afar off, he ran and worshiped him. Amen. And he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now listen to what I'm saying. This is a demon, uh, full of demons. And when Jesus showed up, the word of God, based on, and he got there in spite of what the enemy tried to do to stop him, this guy knows this is bad news for me. And what does he do? He falls down and worships him. Listen, this, de this thing is supposed to bow its knee. Amen. Anything that has a name has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. We carry that name, church. We have the name of Jesus. It is our name now. Praise the Lord. We are joint heirs with Christ. Everything he has, we have. But we have to operate the same way he did in order for it to manifest. Amen? And so all the religious uh, begging and pleading is going to accomplish absolutely nothing. What we need to do is stand up in the power of His might, who we are in Christ, and just tell that thing to back off. No plague comes nigh my dwelling. It's not going to touch my family. It's not going to touch... I pray every morning, I pray for Sally and I, for our families, amen, and the church family. And the confession is identical for all of us. It's the same confession. I, no weapon formed against us is going to prosper. No, I don't care what the devil brings against us. It's not going to be victorious over us because God has already given us the victory. Amen. Amen. We already have the victory, praise the Lord. For he said unto him, come out of that man, yeah. unclean spirit. And he asked him, what's your name? COVID-19. Yep. My name is Legion, for we are many. We're everywhere. We're all over the world. We're killing everybody. And he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. Listen, instead of us being fearful, this virus, this thing from the devil is scared to death that we're going to find out who we are and what power we've got over it. And he's begging, don't, 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 don't mess with me. Just let me go. Let the doctors deal with this. Let the government take care of it. And all the devils besought him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Well, we'll have swine flu. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And forthwith, Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Not only did they run away, they died. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Something powerful was going to take place, and the enemy did everything he could to stop it, but he was no match for the Word of God. The devil knows that God is doing something fantastic in the last days. Whenever that last day might be, but we know, if nothing else, it's the beginning. Because the beginning was clear back in Jesus' day. It was already happening. They'd already identified the Antichrist was in the world. Just demonic influence. Praise the Lord. And I'm just saying that faith is, uh, is living forward, amen, by the Word of God. Not fearful and, and frightening. Not in the absence of questions, but in the face of questions. Amen. I'm sure Joshua had all kinds of questions. But once that angel said, I'm here, the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord, Joshua just shut up and followed. Amen. And when the disciples got to the other side, I'm sure they realized this was way more than a boat ride. This was far more than a storm, just a random uh, bad weather on the lake. This was demonic. And Jesus just destroyed the forces behind all of it. The storm, the waves, the demons. Amen. Matthew 6.33 Having faith doesn't mean you don't ever have fear. Having faith doesn't mean you don't ever have questions. Having faith means you operate in the presence of those questions and that anxiety, but you still go by faith. That's what faith is. Faith looks at things that are not as though they are. Doesn't mean it doesn't see the things that are there. It just means we don't operate by the things we're seeing. We operate by the things that we know to be true, which is the Word of God. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We just talked about that a minute ago. This is not talking about a, uh, you know, a, a geographic location. So we're talking about Jesus. Seek Jesus first. That's the righteousness of God. And then all the stuff is added. All the needs that you might have. All the 
dangers you might encounter, they're all taken care of as a result of that. Amen? This is important. Because if we're talking about our biblical understanding, amen, of what it means to follow Jesus and to be obedient and faithful to his word, that's what he's talking about. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Not to the crap that's going on around. Not to all the stuff we're hearing constantly. Amen? It's focusing on Jesus and the redemption he came to bring. Praise God. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Luke 4, 18 and 19. Praise the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus. He found himself in the Word of God. In fact, he found himself in, in Isaiah 91, I believe it is. But he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, or you, it, it translates, to preach the acceptance or God's acceptance of us. That's what Jesus came to bring. Amen? No more war. No more uh, fear with us in God. Accepted by God. Accepted in the beloved. Amen? And so, Jesus' mission in his life, as well as his death, burial, and resurrection, was to bring about a world that was made new. A world that was made right. Amen? Think about, he comes to uh, initiate this process of restoring the whole creation. The devil knows it. Once it's restored, there's no place for the devil here. He's a, he's a, he can only be here as long as it's fallen. As long as it's in disrepair or, or where God, his kingdom, isn't everywhere, Right? So it, he, he, Jesus comes to initiate this process of restoring this whole creation or bringing it back in line with how God intended it to be in the first place, how God's word describes it. Amen? So the specific uh, representations that he uses here of brokenness, amen, uh, that G, he, Jesus names them as representative of all the world's brokenness that he came to affect. So this is way more than a pandemic. This is, this is fallen man. This is what you get in a fallen world. It isn't, it, isn't, uh, it isn't like it's some punishment from God. It's just the natural outcome of fallen man. It's what you get when people aren't aligned with Christ. They just, you get the dregs. You, you get the nasties. You get the bad stuff. You get the germs. You get the disease. You get the bugs. You get the pestilence. You get all the stuff that the scripture talks about being done away with. Amen? So God's making the world right in Christ. Amen? He's, he's, he says that he, he came to affect the poor, the enslaved, the blind, and the oppressed. Sounds like the human race, right? I mean, no vision for God, no understanding of what God wants to do. Poverty, the poorest people, the richest. We talked about it this morning. The richest people in the world. If they don't have God, they're the poorest people in the world. All that money won't get them one thing. Won't give him one more day on earth. It won't give him one more uh, moment of eternity with the Lord. So God is making the world right in Christ and through us as believers. Amen? We're fellow heirs with Jesus. Jesus affirmed this just, he, just prior to his, his arrest and trial. He said the very thing that I'm talking about this morning. Look at Matthew chapter 25, uh, verses 34 through 36. He said, I've come to deliver... The brokenhearted, the blind, the lame, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Okay, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Praise the Lord. Shalom. In other words, flourishing in every dimension of life. Praise the Lord. Jesus is trying to show us what he came for. I was hungry. Who was hungry? You were hungry. You were hungry. Right? Humans is what he's talking about. When you acknowledge the Jesus in you, God acknowledges it. There's no lack. There's no need. There's no fear. There's no anything missing. It, it's sozo. It is the word where the scripture talks about being whole, being complete. 
Galatians 3, verse 11. I was thinking about toilet paper. We were never out of toilet paper. You know that? We weren't. Divine supply. No, I have a wife who uh, just, for whatever reason, buys gross amounts of products. <laughs> I mean, she just buys a lot at a time. So I'm hearing everybody freaking out about toilet paper. I'm thinking, what? I, what's the deal? Until I went to the store a few times and realized there is no toilet paper anywhere except in my laundry room. Praise the Lord. I stayed up quite a few nights there for the first month thinking, somebody's going to be coming over here to break in. <laughs> They're after that toilet paper, buddy. They'll, they'll be armed and dangerous, praise the Lord. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it's evident. For the just shall live by faith. This is when you find out. This is how we find out. Praise the Lord. Jesus is out to set our world right. Because our world is not right. No. Praise the Lord. We're faced with the contradiction, spiritually speaking, that it's finished, but physically everywhere we look, it looks far from finished. Right? And that's the problem. Because the way it manifests is through our faith. It is finished. He said it's finished. He told us it's finished. We have the milk and the honey. We have the promised land. We are in Christ. But if our focus is all the stuff that's around us, it's not doing us one bit of good. It's not helping us at all. Amen? Praise the Lord. We have to look at things that are not as though they are. Now, it's been fun talking about that for 30 years. Right? But now, the crap has hit the fan. Right? Now, we have to live this way. Now, we are forced to do what God wanted us to do automatically. I'm not saying God's making it happen. I'm just saying God's word's going to come to pass. Yeah. Somebody's going to do it. Amen. And right now would be a good time to start trying. If you haven't, now would be a time to do it. Praise the Lord. Because now, it's not just about our self-preservation. It's about destroying the works of the enemy. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It's about showing the world out there that there is something besides a government, amen, or a military or whatever to bring things into being. There is a God that's greater than all of that, and He wants to be acknowledged. And when He is acknowledged, He shows up mightily on our behalf. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's finished, but it's physically we're seeing things that aren't finished. Amen. So what we're faced with is about the same thing that the disciples were faced with in that boat ride. Or that Joshua was faced with when he looks out over this armed, walled city. Doubt. But doubt is not necessarily... The enemy of faith. And we don't have to be afraid of a mystery. Because even doubt and a mystery, like those fierce winds, amen, and the chaotic seas, and the armed enemy and strong walls, have to submit to Christ. Every knee has to bow. Amen? So to live by faith is to experience God. I mean, people are looking for God. You want God? Start, op start operating by faith. God will show up. He's there every time. Amen? And that's sweet. Praise the Lord. When God shows up, it's like honey on the tongue. No matter how bitter it might have been, no matter how much of a struggle it was, all of a sudden, it's just sweet, and it flows throughout us. Amen? The just walk by faith, not by sight. Faith emerges from a perspective of things hoped for, but not yet seen. That's what he's talking about in, in, in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith comes up out of the perspective of things that are hoped for, but not seen. Healing, deliverance, right? Protection, provision. Faith, as I said before, it's strange and awkward reality. It is a reality, but it is odd. It's weird. It doesn't conform to the natural way of doing things. I mean, who's going to believe that you believe in things that you can't see and not the things that you can see? Right? Makes no sense in the natural. It's like the uh, counterintuitiveness of Joshua and the children of Israel and what Jesus was trying to convey to his disciples in the middle of that storm. Faith will produce the substance you're looking for, the peace, 
the calm, the victory, whatever it might be. Amen? Faith is weird. Just because it's not normal to human character and nature. When we walk by faith, we have a sense, a sense of the bigness of God, the power of God, the authority of God. It's like Sheila was saying. I mean, that was, that was so on as well. Look, we're looking for God in something, and God's saying, I've been here all along. You don't realize what power you've got. You, you've been using that power to, to plant me into those grandchildren. That same planting that you're putting into your grandchildren is yours. In other words, you can't even give it if you don't have it. So he was not just reassuring you that what you were saying to your grandchildren was right. He was telling you, that's what I am for you, Sheila. You are blessed. You are protected. God wants nothing but the best for you and your life. He wants you to live fearlessly without cowardice, without fear, without anxiety, without stress, just like you want your grandchildren to grow up and know that they are loved and appreciated and that they are special to God just the way they are to you. And God wants you to know in the process, don't forget, it's the same for you. I'm feeling the same thing about y'all. You know, if we, don't, if we would do anything to protect our children and grandchildren from the mess that's going on around here, how much more will our Heavenly Father because he tells us, he said, you being evil, he doesn't mean that we're evil, he just means you, you being flesh and blood are limited. And you care that much for your children and your grandchildren, how much more does your heavenly Father care for you? Amen. See, it's hard for us to grasp that. And yet, I, I was sitting on the deck the other night, my grandkids, the youngest ones, called me Popo. And they know they got me wrapped around their finger, you know, they can ask anything, whatever they want, I'll do it and get it if I can, you know, if it's available. And it just struck me. I'm looking out over the yard, and it really pretty. We'd mowed and cleaned up. And I thought, you know, Lord, now I know we don't have the, you know, the, it's not a multi-million dollar place, but it's a beautiful place. It's, it's rustic. It's country. It's two acres, two and a half acres. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, Lord, if somebody would have told me that I'd live here and have the peace and the joy that I experience here, 40 years ago, I'd have never believed you. I was headed downhill, full speed. I was thinking, if I ever get a decent apartment, it'll be good. Amen? I mean, I was in a mess. And it never ceases to amaze me when I look out over that, and I think, God, I never knew how much you loved me. I never had any idea what you wanted for me it was far more than what I wanted for myself. And I just started calling him. I know this sounds crazy, but I know how I feel about my kids, and I just start calling him Popo. Oh, Abba, Daddy. Because it makes me feel good when the kids call me that, because it's not just Grandpa, you know. I got a T-shirt that says, call me Popo, Grandpa's for old men. <laughs> <sighs> Praise the Lord. But I really felt that was God talking to me the way I'm thinking about my grandchildren. I'd do anything for them. And he's saying, Nathan, I love you. This is you, Lord. I give it to you. I've, I've made it available to you. And I just said, thank you, Popo. I love you, Popo. That's not an easy thing for me because I didn't have, and I don't want to get into a psychological thing, but, you know, I wasn't raised with that kind of a relationship with my own father. I mean, it wasn't, it just it was not demonstrative. It wasn't loving, hugging, kissing, so on and so forth. I recognized his responsibility for me, and he did take care of all that stuff. He paid the bills and fed us and everything else. But there wasn't that sense of, I just want to be with him, and I, I know he wants to be with me. That's what God's trying to teach all of us, what a true father is, what a, what a heavenly father is really all about, and how much he does love us and care for us. Amen? Jesus told his disciples to go to the other side, and he told Joshua he had come as a commander of the Lord's army. In other words, no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. I got the sword of the Spirit here. I'm going to whip up on these people, just as Jesus was planning on doing to that storm and to the demons on the other side of the lake. You know, I started out in the beginning that God saw darkness, and he said light. 
God spoke what he desired. He spoke his will, which is his word. God's word is his will, and it carries power. It's a spiritual force. It's what he's telling us in, Rome, uh, in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith emerges. It's the substance that comes out of the hope that we have. He framed the world with his words. You can't build without substance. Faith-filled words are God's substance. That's why I said when you speak faith, you got, God is everywhere. God is right there. God is in the midst of that. Faith, walking by faith, gives us intimacy with God. Gives us a greater awareness of God. And not just that he exists, but that he is greater than any obstacle or any situation or circumstance we might be faced with. Amen? When my kid, grandkids and that go, they go anywhere with me, we do anything, they just know it's going to be taken care of. They're not fretting about who's going to buy this or who's going to pay for that or are we going to be safe with Popo and all that. No. They just know if I'm with him, I'm going to get something cool, right? And it's going to be good. It's all going to be good. Amen? I like to spoil them. I couldn't necessarily spoil my own kids because I didn't have the resources to do it. I mean, I was too busy trying to make a living and pay the rent, whatever it might have been. But now I get the opportunity to give back what I wasn't maybe able to do all the time for my own kids, I can now do for their kids. And in, in that sense, I'm doing it for my kids, right? Because it's special to them. They're, they're, they're their, their kids, right? And that's what we're at. That's what God is. God transported his faith with words. And he caused the creation, amen, as a result of that. And he's doing it again. It's a transformation, amen. And that's the way God changes things. It might sound simple, but it's also profound. It's just the way it works. Jesus to his disciples, or Jesus to Joshua. We're talking about using the power that's in God's word to cause us to live victoriously in this life, in any situation, or in any circumstance. So I'm saying this morning, let's see some walls come down. Amen? And let's get to our destination Amen. that God has called us to. Yeah, there's going to be storms. He didn't say there wouldn't be some storms. He didn't say there wouldn't be some crap. He just said, if you stick with me, I'm going to get you the victory, and I'll get you to your destination. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless all of you again. Amen. No judgment. We're not, we're not criticizing anybody for not being here or whatever. I'm just saying, let's, faith is a substance that we have to right. initiate. Yeah. So let's work together to help every one of us live in the fullness of faith so that we can have the impact in this world that God intended us to have. I'm telling you, this thing is going to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. And that means to each and every one of us. That thing comes to my house, it's bowing his knee because Jesus lives there. Yeah. Amen? God bless all of you. Again, all of you on the Internet, Facebook, we love you. Appreciate you being part of the service today. Let's, let's take this next week and let's take some walled cities. Amen? And let's reach the destination that God has chosen for each one of us, which is victory in every situation. Amen? God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.